stopping. All right. Hey, folks, welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight on um, November 3rd, 2022 uh, with uh, for, for Intersectionality Talks. It is a digital lecture series here at Plymouth State University that focuses on intersectional approaches to literature and culture. It's a it's it's a it's a it's a wide berth. We get some really interesting uh, speakers coming in, and tonight we've got Dr. Corey Baysmore James coming to talk with us about land acknowledgments, uh, when, how, why, and why not to use land acknowledgment statements. Uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Baysmore James got a presentation, and then we'll have open uh, Q and A. Right now, we've got, uh, for Zoom security purposes, uh, everybody except for hosts and co-hosts uh, have mics and uh, cameras disabled, but we've got a small group tonight, so when we get to Q&A, we'll probably open all that stuff up and we can just have a freewheeling discussion. Um, Alberto Ramos, uh, I, I should mention, uh, the Intersectionality Talks series is ordinarily co-sponsored by the um, uh, PSU Open Collab which if you found us, you probably found us through their publicity or their website. That's where a recording of this will live. Um, and by the Humanities, Cultures, and Communications Academic Unit on campus. Uh, our two offerings this fall are also sponsored by the um, Diversity, Equity, and Social Justice Center here at PSU, uh, uh, which uh, opened this summer. And Alberto Ramos is our first director here. And we love him so much and are glad that he's here. Um, our next event, by the way, is going to be on November 16th, and it's called, it's about a book entitled It's Not Free Speech, uh, which is about academic freedom and uh, white supremacy in America. I'm really excited for that. Um, so without further ado, nobody's here to hear me talk. Uh, Dr. Baysmore James, uh, take it away. Thank you. I was taking note of that book. That sounds like one I should read. <laughs> Hi, hello everyone. How me talk you happy? John Tay Wash Day Nabe Chuzapi Ke Omakao Himachiapi. Hello, my name is Corey Baysmore James. I use she her pronouns. I'm a member of the Seneca Nation of Indians of Western New York. Um, but I introduce myself, I say hello in Lakota because I grew up in South Dakota with my Lakota relatives. And that I'm gonna go ahead and open my PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. Just give me one second to get set up here. There we go. So we're going to talk about um, acknowledging the land, giving land acknowledgement statements. Why? Why not? Um, and I will talk through my my personal journey. I feel like for myself, I continuously am going through a journey of why or why not or should we or shouldn't we. Um, it's not so simple and black and white and the absolute yes or no for me and it keeps changing and there's all sorts of great um articles and people talking about it and discussing it and coming to different conclusions around it and so it's a lively topic and it's a good topic that we should continue to discuss and with that I will start with an example my own land acknowledgement statement that I like to use when I give a, a talk and that is the land I speak to you from today is the original homeland of the Dakota and Anishinaabe tribal nations. I honor and respect the indigenous peoples who were forcibly removed from and who are still connected to this territory. It is my ongoing responsibility to own my part in their continued displacement, incorporate indigenous knowledge into my work and establish meaningful reciprocal partnerships with indigenous communities. And in my everyday life, you know, here in the Twin Cities, I'm at the University of Minnesota Twin Cities, and um, I find it really important as an Indigenous person, but as a person also on Indigenous land that is not my own, I find it important to be involved with Native communities, to develop Native community here on campus, and be an active participant of the communities here in the Twin Cities, and um, get involved with the, we have many, many Native nonprofits here in the Twin Cities. I'm very lucky to be in a space that has such a strong Native community. Um, I like to promote and, uh, and purchase from Native-owned businesses. There are so many here, luckily, um, and also participate in 
and uh, and participated with other uh, Native businesses online. Uh, and and so I think it's important to be involved and know who's around and and participate in opportunities to learn and continuously learn and grow about the Native people of this of this place that I'm in. So why do we acknowledge the land? Um, well, because this is, first of all, something that we've always done as Native people. Um, it's really interesting that it's become this practice, this, um, I don't even know what to call it. It's, it's, it's continuously evolving as this practice that we do in higher ed now that we didn't used to do, but it's always something I grew up with in my Native communities. Um, it's a protocol, it's a cultural protocol. It's a way of showing respect and humility for the places that we are. It's a simple um, statement that, that we make. It's, it's much more formalized. Maybe that's the word I'm looking for. It's become a much more formalized practice than what I'm used to <laughs> um, in the way that we do it now. And it shows up in higher ed or in, uh, in industry, but it's a step towards correcting the stories and the practices that erase indigenous people's history and culture. And it's a step towards inviting and honoring truth and reconciliation. Um, acknowledging the land is acknowledging indigenous people's cultural connection, the place and space. It's our cultures, it's indigenous, because indigenous people, we see ourselves as part of the land. We don't own land, we don't, um, view ourselves or other people as owners of someone who it's like you don't have the audacity to say I own this land but I'm part of it part of the land and the land is part of us it's where our creation stories are it's where our people come from um it's about sacred relationships and birthplaces and ceremonial sites of our people and the responsibilities that come along with that so when we speak we acknowledge who we are, the communities and the families that we come from, and we acknowledge the generosity of the people hosting us uh, when we're not in our own homes. It's creating and utilizing uh, land acknowledgement as a part of engaging in a healing process with local tribes. Many, if not most of our institutions have troubled histories with tribes that we are around or that we've displaced. Um, and those histories need to be reconciled and healed. So taking a step back to think about and acknowledge and recognize where we sit as an institution, where we live and operate, where we benefit uh, from stolen sacred lands is a necessary step. It's one little bitty step, but it's an important one uh, towards moving forward with tribes that we live amongst. And it's an important exercise for our own personal development to think about the implications and the obligations that we have while on Indigenous land to foster a sense of responsibility to learn more about the people whose lands we live on. We should always stop to think about how have we come to be here on this stolen land and how colonization has contributed to our ability to live here learn here, profit from being here. Um, a friend of mine talks about the, <clears throat> the late Chief Andy Thomas of the Esquimalt First Nation, who used to say, how are you going to walk differently on this land knowing what you know now? So we need to think about what is our responsibility and our relationship with the land and the people of this land. So land acknowledgements are not <laughs> should not be tokenizing. Um, I found this this meme online to be really funny. It's a native person kind of being toted to say, I'm here to acknowledge that I am on my own land. <laughs> you know, we often um, are asked to do this. I was just asked literally yesterday um, in an email by a department on campus saying, we're hosting this big meeting, that's this is an important diversity meeting, and we would love to invite you to come give a land acknowledgement. Don't worry, it's really quick um, at the beginning of our meeting, and then you can leave. And it's just like, oh my God, <laughs> I have nothing to do with this meeting that you're having. I've never been involved with this committee. Um, why would you 
tote me in this native random native person really to come in and and say I acknowledge that I'm on my land thank you and goodbye you have your meeting now without me <laughs> you know feels very token tokenizing even though for them they were they had of course good intentions and the purpose is <clears throat> to do something that they feel is the right thing to do um and it always takes me a minute to think about how do I want to respond <laughs> um you don't want to, I don't want to be nasty in how I respond. I don't want to um, make people feel the way that made me feel. Um, but I do want them to know why that's not really acceptable and that's not okay. So I let them know, you know, I think in my experience of land acknowledgements, I think it makes more sense for you all to give your own acknowledgement. You don't need to bring in a native person you can do it yourself <laughs> and say why it is important that you acknowledge the land and really think about do that work for yourself <clears throat> of not acknowledging the land that you're on and that you're meeting on and the land acknowledgement also shouldn't be a crappy apology <laughs> another funny meme um i on facebook way too much clearly um but think about really what is what makes a good apology it's acknowledgement of another person's pain. <clears throat> it's ownership of damage that we might have caused. It's um, committing to rectify harmful behavior. And it's appreciation for the opportunity to learn and change. So if we are thoughtful about what makes a good apology, we can also be thoughtful of, of what makes a good land acknowledgement. Um, so we give land acknowledgements at the beginning of our work with an honest and open mind and open heart and being mindful of the land that we're on and what it took for us to be here before we proceed with our activities of the day. Having a land acknowledgement is acknowledging the space the institution occupies and acknowledging that it doesn't belong to us. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't belong to anyone, but it's a part of a people that, that um, were once here or are still here. It entails an understanding of the trauma from settler colonialism that made it possible for us to live and work here. And it reminds us who the communities are that are still connected to this land that our institution is placed on and whether they were the original people of this land or were they people that have been long removed from the land that we're on now. So bringing this all together, land acknowledgements are often written or spoken statements that recognize the tribes that have a spiritual connection to the land, the history of that tribe's displacement, a commitment to serving indigenous peoples and not placing them in the past as if they're not still here, and also humility that we have, that we ought to have for our, our institution's ability to exist in this space. <clears throat> there are so many, so many great land acknowledgement resources out there. Google is our friend. <laughs> so go check out Google and just look for land acknowledgement resources because, you know, we often ask for Native people's labor. That's another thing I get asked for a lot is, can you help us write a land acknowledgement statement? And I'm always really hesitant to do so because I think that's a labor that you need to do on your own. You know, it's, it's a labor of love. It's a labor of pain and difficulty, and you need to wrestle through that. Um, and of course, there are really wonderful Native folks out there who will be happy to help, and you should pay them to do that, that work um, if that's what they're interested in doing. Um, but there's great resources out there that Native people have worked really hard to develop. So utilize those resources that we've already made and put out there. <clears throat> um, and I will walk us through some resources that I've already been created. Of course, it's it's a little difficult to do via PowerPoint. So I just took some images um, and I also have some great videos to share. So this is one that's much more widely publicized now. I think a lot of people are, are aware of this one now, this uh, map service from nativeland.ca. Um, um, in which you can, if you go in this search bar, if you can see my mouse, you can type in the location of where you are 
So even if you're in a different location, if you're going to present in some other place and you don't know where the tribes are or the, which tribes are from that area, or if you've never learned about the tribes in the area that you live in now, you can search which tribes are there <clears throat> that you ought to consider acknowledging. And this is not necessarily perfect. Maps aren't ever gonna be perfect to identify all the tribes in one location. I know um, where I'm from, where I did my undergrad, the University of South Dakota, they have st really struggled to write a land acknowledgement statement because um, the native people there can't agree on which tribes ought to be acknowledged in their, in their acknowledgement um, because that's political and um, it's not always, it's not black and white. We did not make maps to say you belong there and we belong here. People moved um, and moved about and were in different places at different times of the year um, or after certain instances happened, they may have started here and now they're there, you know? So it's, it's not so clear, but here's the starting point. Um, you, here's, I put in my hometown, Vermilion, South Dakota, um, and it shows the Ocheti Shakomun right here, the Yankton Sioux tribe and the Umaha people, um, which people may or may not agree with <laughs> all of those, but this is a start at least. Um, and you can also use this, this site to look up the languages of the, of the, of the location that were spoken, were and are spoken in the area. Uh, as well as treaty, the history of treaties in that area. Another resource, especially after using one like the maps, is this one from the National Congress of American Indians, in which they have a listing of all the tribes. Um, I believe they would include both federally recognized and state recognized tribes. Um, there's also completely not recognized tribes that are just as legitimate as the rest. Um, but here's an alphabetical listing of all the tribes that you can find, and you can see a little bit more information about them. They may have a website. So if you're interested in learning more about the tribes um, that you're acknowledging, here's this good starting point. And I want to show you a video. So this is another resource, this website here. Um, and I think it's just always helpful to hear from multiple voices and viewpoints. Uh, on a topic. So this is a video they created um, a few years back that shows this is, you know, this is early on really in the implementation of land acknowledgements from institutions and people's reactions to hearing uh, land acknowledgements being done. So I'm going to play this short video. I'd like to recognize the Algonquin Nation on whose traditional territory we are gathering we acknowledge them as the past, present, and future caretakers of this land. Wherever I go on that green earth, I do the Lakota tradition of acknowledging the four directions, the land, and the people living there. On the Kimaka, as I call grandmother earth, the land, I view her as a, a sacred you know, living entity, and that's the way we acknowledge it in you know, Lakota thought philosophy. As a Native person, for any kind of confrontation that might come up, or I'm preparing myself to remind people of all those things that they forget about. I was at a meeting in Minneapolis, and the room was primarily non-Native people. I was in a non-Native organization, but this executive director got up and said, okay, we're going to get started. So everybody, you know, was sitting down and getting quiet. She said, I'd like to get started by acknowledging the Indigenous culture of this, of Minnesota. And I was like, first, I was like, wow. And it just made everything like fall away a little bit from me. My guard went down. I was more relaxed because by saying that, like, that means she understands something that is just like, you can't talk about, right? There's just, it just relaxed me as a minority, as a woman and as a native person. Like it just like, like pulled away this layer that's always there. You know? It was super cool. We're at a, we're at a time where um, 
non-native cultures are understanding the traditions of indigenous peoples for, for probably the first time in our histories. So like when I go to New Zealand, the protocol is to acknowledge each other's ancestors and your mountains and your rivers. And, and, and that's such a beautiful tradition. When people are in that space and say, we acknowledge who you are, this land, the, where your people come from, they're saying, we acknowledge your relationship, but we're also creating that relationship. So this is a good thing. The important thing would be that folks would then sit with that. Like, what does it mean that our settlement is occupying this space? And what responsibility do I have considering that legacy to these contemporary things, right? And how do I stop distancing myself from that? Ideally, that would be, for me, the impact that this has. If you start acknowledging that the land that you're standing on and the space that you are in belong to people that are still here, like, make so much more room for understanding of all these other issues. It's one of those little things that, like, if it could just tip a little bit, all the, like, dominoes that could fall from it, I think are important. I'm like imagining it and like wanting to live in that like <laughs> the thing that I'm imagining like yeah that's actually really beautiful it's just being a genuine human being to acknowledge each other's histories um the good and the bad I just think that's a really beautiful video that really captured the feeling that a lot of people have when they hear a land acknowledgement statement. Um, and usually more so when it's by non-Native people, um, because we're not used to that. We're not expecting that necessarily for non-Native people. Um, and I know the first time I heard it, I have that kind of sense of awe and wonder, I'm like, whoa, I've never experienced this before. I the first time I, I heard it was at a conference um, when my professional home, uh, ACPA, um, and the conference was held that year in Montreal in Canada. And um, they had elders from the Haudenosaunee, which is my people are the Haudenosaunee, the Six Nations. And they opened this conference. It's a student affairs conference. It's not native specific at all, um, but they opened the conference. It was my first year attending that conference with Haudenosaunee elders um, giving a welcome and, and there was a whole acknowledgement of them and us being in their space. And I was just in the audience, blown away, trying not to cry, <laughs> as you saw in the video, like how powerful that was just to feel so, <clears throat> I don't know, welcomed and acknowledged in a way I've never been in a non-Native conference you know in a non-native conference I expect those type of protocols and it wouldn't be so powerful <clears throat> as it was in that space for me so it's it's the start of it and oftentimes when it's done well it can be really powerful and meaningful uh, for the people in the room so this resource they also have a guide so for anyone thinking about making their own land acknowledgement statement um, this is a good place to start. Um, like I said, one of many, many resources um, that you can use for thinking about developing a land acknowledgement statement. And they also have some cool uh, Zoom backgrounds as well. <laughs> so and some more resources now. These are ones that are examples of land acknowledgement statements that I've found over the years to be really good ones. So the first one is at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Um, they have history. <laughs> they, have, they have history to make up for, for sure, as most institutions do, but they have a very public history uh, with Native people. And so seeing them do a good job with the land acknowledgement on their homepage, from their page from the chancellor, was really good. It was a really... Um, long acknowledgement, you know, depends on the, they vary so much in size and length and shape. <laughs> um, but I thought this was a good one. And what I really thought was neat about theirs was that they included this pronunciation for the tribes that they acknowledge. 
um, audio where you can click along and, and hear the audio. Um, and so I'll show that I demonstrated that by videotaping myself going through the audio. So I'll show that quickly. Peoria. Kaskaskia. Piankashaw. Wea. So see, isn't that this, this really neat little tool that they put on their site? They both have the the phonetic spelling of how to say the tribes and they they have the audio that's helpful because um, as I found a lot of folks are nervous to do land acknowledgements because they're scared of mispronunci mispronunciating the names of the tribes which can be pretty off-putting when, <laughs> when that happens um, and it can be very embarrassing when you're the one who's done that um, so it's just helpful to it's a helpful tool to get more folks involved with land acknowledgements by not being as embarrassed um, to do it, to do it wrong or pronounce, pronounce names incorrectly. Um, another example is the convention. Now this is the conference I was actually talking about. I later became <clears throat> that conference's um, indigenous uh, advisor for the convention team, which is, I really love ACPA because not, they've made taken so many steps to be inclusive of Native folks in their convention and our Native population in the convention has grown because of this. But one of the things they've done is incorporated um, an Indigenous advisor to the executive director. And annually, they have an Indigenous advisor to the convention steering team that helps put on the convention. Um, and when I was in their role for 2019, we went, were in Boston that year. Um, so I wrote the land acknowledgement for the conference for the year. Um, and I added a whole bunch of links for the site. We had a page on, on the website where you could see the land acknowledgement statement. So we had the phonetic spellings. We also had links to, um, to the tribes themselves and to local or organizations that people could support while they're there if they were interested. Uh, we also included some language about what is a land acknowledgement statement and why do it. Um, and this conference, as many have, started incorporating the expectation, I would almost a rule <laughs> that every um, session of the conference, every person who's presenting needed to have a land acknowledgement slide. Like we wrote the land acknowledgement and then we put it in the slide deck that all the, the presenters are to use. And every presenter is supposed to do that land acknowledgement statement. And um, this is one area for me where it does begin to get problematic, I think, um, because it's set up an expectation that every single presenter needed to do it and do it well. Um, meanwhile, not everyone's comfortable with land acknowledgements. Not everyone understands them. Not everyone agrees with them, um, native or not. And so it created, I, I felt an expectation that set us up um, for hurt feelings because uh, if Native folks are attending sessions that someone didn't do the land acknowledgement or uh, they did it poorly by just saying, oh, here's the slide, you've heard it already, I'm not gonna say it again, or <laughs> say something that's really flippant about it um, or even something really hurtful sometimes about it. Uh, I think that's a setup that we kind of did to ourselves um, by making that such a strong expectation. Um, we still do that and many conferences do still do that. Um, in my opinion, I think it should be optional. I think it makes sense to have a land acknowledgement statement for the conference, definitely to do it at the openings and the big keynote kind of things, um, but then to allow it to be optional to the attendees uh, so that hopefully it doesn't create an expectation that just is a setup for causing harm. Like I said, there's no, no, completely agreed on way to go about this yet. <laughs> I don't know if there ever will be. Um, here's another excellent example, another video I'll show. Uh, a friend of my colleague at the University of Victoria let me know about their process and what they've done. And they created this video with um, an elder who I believe is the last, let's see, uh, is one of the, the last elders speaking the language, the Lekwungen language. 
uh, yeah, the last fluent speaker, and they had this whole indigenous plan they went through. So it's like a strategic plan, the EI plan, an indigenous specific plan for the institution. And part of it was having this elder um, give this acknowledgement and talk about the land that they're on. And in the original version, they also had the president of the university in this video, but they've switched presidents since then. And the new president um, hasn't been part of the video yet, but here's the version with the elder. such a beautiful video and I can't always when I'm presenting I can't like watch it really closely because it chokes me up <laughs> but I think it's a really beautiful uh, video that has an elder who's welcoming um, people in their own language and it's, it's really beautiful and a good I feel a good way to honor the people um, another type of acknowledgement that is coming about and people are talking about what well, we're talking about Land acknowledgments, we should also be thinking about labor acknowledgments because um, labor acknowledgments are a way to honor and remember the violent histories and legacies of settler colonialism and to collectively begin to acknowledge the historical labor that has allowed our society to be where it is today. And so by acknowledging our history, we can then work to reconcile and redress those histories and legacies. I'm talking about slave labor that um, has been used to create our whole um, class system, our whole, you know, the United States wouldn't be what it is today if we didn't um, forcefully use slave labor in this country. And we owe a lot of debt to the families of that, that awful legacy of, of slavery in our country. And so it makes sense too, to think about, you know, the buildings that our institutions have some of them may have been built by slave labor and we need to we need to look in that history and know that history and and recognize what our um what our institutions have how and where our institutions have benefited from slave labor as well um so i like to credit my colleagues uh tj stewart uh who's done some great work on, on labor acknowledgments as well as another colleague uh jason wallace and I also have some examples uh, for, for labor acknowledgements too. And um, for the sake of time, I'll post them here so you can get a screenshot um, where you can find these easily online. Okay, so all these great things about land acknowledgements, but what about the arguments not to do them? <laughs> Because like I said, I am also on this journey of ebb and flow and how I feel about land acknowledgements and do they make sense? Do we, should we do them? Are they, are they doing us any good? Are they, um, are they just another checkbox diversity item that we're just doing now uh, with no thought behind it? You know, sometimes 
labor or land and labor acknowledgements are more harmful than they are good. And so we need to really think about the reasons why we're doing them. Um, we need to make sure they're not um, just, I don't even know the word, they're just not another thing. You know, they're they're in a lot of our, um, a lot of our um, email signatures now, mine included. And some people see that as like really, pitiful like oh that's as much ceremony as you're giving it as like you would put uh you know your your office hours and then you have your <laughs> acknowledgement statement um sometimes they can be really awful when they're when they're done with obvious um lack of intention um a lot of times when they're done they sound like we're giving acknowledgement to the people who are used to be here, um, that they have gone now along with the dinosaurs. They don't live here anymore, but we do acknowledge that one time they used to live here and they once e existed in this place. So that feels like almost like a eulogy <laughs> of Native people when we are still here and we are still connected to this land. Um, and like I said, we, there's often where oftentimes where Native people are being tokenized into um, being kind of trotted out, like I said, and say, can you show up for the first five minutes, if that, of our event, say a few words so we can check that item off, but don't take too long because we have a lot of things to talk about, and please be on your way. You're not part of this meeting. You know, this is not about you. We just need to do this thing, so please come be our token Native for two minutes of our of our meeting today <laughs> um it's it's it can be creating unreasonable expectations like i said um when we force everyone to do something that isn't so clear about how to do it or why to do it um it causes harm by people doing it in ways that are harmful or saying things that are really um inappropriate um, and it puts people in a place of, of fear of doing it wrong. And, and we don't, that's not what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be that way. That's not the intention of land acknowledgements to do this performance. It's meant to be a very humble and honest recognition uh, of people and space and place that we're in. Okay, so with that, there's a lot of common questions. I'm gonna answer these common questions quickly and then we'll get to your actual questions. Uh, so common question I get is, what if there are no longer tribes in my area? That was one I got a lot. I, went, I did my uh, graduate education in Georgia where there were five tribes that were original to the area, but they were removed with the Trail of Tears and so, People would always ask me, well, who are we acknowledging? There's no tribes here anymore. It's like, well, there used to be. Um, there's five tribes, actually, that used to be here. And still, their people are here. We just don't see them because we don't take care of people here. You know, we don't prioritize Native people here. Um, but they are, I promise you, they're in your classrooms. They're at this university and maybe they don't feel safe to let you know that they're there to out themselves as Native people. Um, I know it was tough for me anytime I was in Georgia and someone found out I was Native. I got all kinds of questions that were very kind of exoticizing of me. And it was it, it's creepy and, and, and not comfortable usually. Um, so let's think about who used to be here. How is it that they're not here anymore? What's that history? Um, and who's here? Where are they now? Are, are they around? How can we, we recognize that history and own up to our, our institution's part in that history? Another common question, I'm just one person, what can I do? <laughs> So often I get that question of, well, you know, I think it would be great if my institution had a land acknowledgement statement, but who am I? You know, I'm just a student or I'm just a lone faculty or whoever. What am I going to do? I can't, I don't have the power or authority to create a land, make my university have a land acknowledgement statement. 
I say use your sphere of influence. It doesn't matter who you are, where you are in the institution, lead by role modeling the practice. If you feel like this is a practice that makes sense for you to do, if you put in the time and the intention to do it in a good way and with a good heart, um, role model it. Um, if you're a faculty, um, start your course for the semester with an acknowledgement or put it in your syllabus. Or, you know, if you're a staff person, um, think about what meetings or what events it would make sense to say at the beginning. Um, just role modeling it and getting people to go, oh, I hadn't heard that. I hadn't thought of doing that. What was that? <laughs> and get the conversation started and, and let people decide for themselves, of course, if they want to do that. But use your sphere and, and ask people how they feel about it. Ask people, ask your students, what do they think about it? Do they feel like that's an important practice? Um, get, get people involved in the conversation. Another common question, where and how should we use land acknowledgement statements? Um, I think it's a delicate balance. I don't think it's an obvious, easy answer. Um, I think if we say it just constantly every single day, you know, or every single meeting or every single class period, then it, it gets too easy to be a checkbox diversity item. Like just, oh, I have to say this and then I have to say that. And now I can get onto the meat of the conversation. Um, so you, you have to be thoughtful about what makes sense for you, what makes sense for the context. Um, like if it's a major uh, address, probably, yes, that makes sense to do it. Um, if it's um, maybe the graduation ceremony, you know, something that's bigger and makes more sense. Or if it's just like, you know, we need to have this conversation and it's part of a regular meeting, then have that conversation. And my last one that I'll share is a common question. So we created a land acknowledgement statement. Are we done now? <clears throat> I'm gonna look in the chat. What do you think? Created a land acknowledgement statement. Are we done? Is the institution done now? <laughs> I see smells like a checkbox. I agree with you. Um, no, of course not. That's just, nope, I see a big nope, good. It's just the start. A land acknowledgement statement is a very small step in doing something that's actually meaningful. Um, it, it Just a statement by itself is meaningless. It's an empty statement. And I promise you, if you start just doing a land acknowledgement statement and nothing else, you're going to get a lot of um, you're going to get a lot of, of pushback of people saying, well, why are you doing it? What do you mean? Or do you actually care about Native people? What are you actually doing? What's the action behind it? Um, and that's the whole thing is, is um, learning about what is the current and, and historical relationship between your institution and the tribes of the area. What are the needs and experiences of Native students, staff, faculty, communities around you? Um, in what ways might we be creating unnecessary barriers for Native people to participate in the institution? Uh, in what ways might we be positioned to provide support to Native communities that we're not doing now? Um, these are all things to ask yourself and think about of how else can you be involved and in what ways can you make it meaningful? Um, <clears throat> I like in the chat, uh, words should be sh supplemented by action. Exactly right. So with that, I will go ahead and close the PowerPoint and say meow is, you know, thank you for attending and being so active in the chat. Uh, but now it's your chance to ask questions that you have. Always so great to hear you, Dr. Bazemore James. Thank you so much. I'll just start us off. Um, so you talked about this a lot, uh, sort of in the different views of land acknowledgements. I'm curious, I tend to err on the side as someone who thinks they're really important, um, but I interact with a lot of people who think differently. And so um, how would you go about coaching someone who really doesn't see the value of doing a land acknowledgement? Um, 
yeah, how might you go about that conversation? Mm. <sighs> well, it's 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 not easy and it's not a straightforward thing to do. Of course, you know, some people are really resistant to change and um, a lot of times people who are very resistant to change and to diversity efforts um, feel it as a personal attack, like you're taking something away from me in order to provide for someone else. Um, and so it's it can be a really tough conversation, but I think um, maybe even opening it, the conversation around like, do we know our history? What is our history? What have we ever um, had Native students at this institution? How many? What has their experience been? Do we know? Have we ever asked? How can we ask? What can we find out about their their uh, needs at our institution? And just kind of go into it slowly and come to the recognition. I bet you, if you get to a point of asking Native students and staff and community, you probably will get the recommendation to do a land acknowledgement. <laughs> And then it's not from you, you know, it's from the people and you have to think about like, well, that's an easy win, isn't it? If, if something they're asking for is a statement, we can write a statement. That's not, that's not a difficult thing to do. That would be my recommendation. Thank you so much. I think uh, Liz, I see has her hand up. Hello, let me just get in that situation. Okay. Hello. Um, I have just been thinking a lot recently about a shared interest in Alberta, sort of in response to your question, but also just what I've been thinking about lately is like the question, where are we? Like, where am I right now? And as I was working through my own sort of like hesitations and anxieties around land acknowledgement for the Eagle Pond author series, which is held in the Smith Recital Hall, part of that process for me was like, who's Smith? Like, and so like, I don't think Smith is indigenous, <laughs> but, but like, but the larger feeling to me was more of like imagining starting an evening, starting an event with a, with a land acknowledgement that, that foregrounded the history and contributions and legacies of indigenous peoples, but, and also like other ways of kind of pausing for a moment to be like, where are we yeah. right now? Like we're at Plymouth State University, which is on this land, right? That was not always ours. And we're in the Smith recital hall and like, it's November, like, so I think for me, part of maybe the appeal, and I think this would, I mean, just to be real, like fly at Plymouth, like, I think Plymouth has always sort of imagined itself as very connected to place. And I think that's true in some ways and not true in other ways. And like, so that idea also of just sort of taking almost like a contemplative moment to really ask yourself like, where you are yes. that day, which wouldn't necessarily be exactly where you were in the same place in like spring at a different event. So like, I don't know, I've been thinking about it so much. And so I really appreciate um, this program and these insights and like this encouragement to do the work and this encouragement to think about like, when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate. And so, but yeah, that's that's where, and, and I just say one more thing. I was on a, with my poetry students on a campus tree tour. And I also had this moment of like, I've been on this campus for 20 years and learning the names of these trees makes me feel like I've never been on this campus before. Mm -hmm. And that felt like relevant somehow to the question of acknowledging where you are and sort of not, and sort of being open to like learning <laughs> more of like that you didn't understand, that I didn't understand about where I was or like seeing these new dimensions or layers. So I just feel this talk has been really energizing and I'm really grateful for it. Thank you. Good, thank you.
I think that's a good way of going about it too, is making it a moment to have a discussion and think and just stop and think about, wait, we probably, many of us have been in this institution a long time, but when did we stop thinking of ourselves as learners? Like we are learners too. <laughs> we need to always be learning and and taking those moments to stop and contemplate things that we hadn't thought about before. Awesome. B, I see that um, you had your hand up and then Kristen, I think, had a question after B. Yeah, um, so you guys were talking about how like there were people who you couldn't really get to agree upon to make the land acknowledgements. And I was thinking before, like probably even people within their own communities, like within native communities don't agree on on one thing either like you said like it's not black and white so that makes it almost like difficult for me to approach not necessarily land acknowledgements because I'm probably not gonna do those I don't really do any like events or anything where I would need to do that but um like it just makes me wonder how I can get a better perspective from people who I'm not in like who I, I, like I'm not just going to like go out to a native person and be like can you answer this for me but like also like if I look it up I'm not going to have the diverse perspectives and I don't really know what is the right perspective because there probably is none and it's like it's just hard for me to wrap my head around like what is like the appropriate way to approach something that no one agrees on yeah, yeah it's really tough it's really tough because um, you know, in Native communities, we really rely on our oral history, and the oral history that we grew up with in our family or in our community is like gospel to us. And if someone comes in and they're like, well, no, our our oral history says X and yours says Y, and then it gets really messy. Um, and that's okay. It's okay to be messy, um, I think. And I think it makes sense to look for opportunities or create opportunities, you know, work with people like Alberto and Nick and and the folks on campus who will, who, who do put on these kind of events and and try to find um, uh, opportunities to invite native folks to share their stories and their oral history and their knowledge and um, know that sometimes they won't always agree. <laughs> and that's okay, that's just part of it. This is part of the work, this is part of, our history is that it's messy and complicated and it's not gonna be black and white all the time. And that's okay. Um, and because we aren't, we we operate in a different way than the kind of the, the typical Western Euro American approach to things. And so um, complexity, absolutely, it's part of it and welcome it and just let it be that, be complex. Um, but invite invite different voices in conversation. Don't rely on just one uh, source of information. Mm. Yeah, and also thank you for like putting those resources up because that was my immediate question. Almost like Liz said, like I don't know which websites are legit or the best one. Like um, because you know I don't have anyone to ask <laughs> because I don't know any native people. So it's like you know, I can try to just Google things, but I really don't know what's reliable. So I appreciate that you had those. Absolutely, that's so true. There's so many things out there written by non-Native people, but you do have to be careful to make sure that you're you're looking at things that are written by Native folks. And um, a lot of times I'll talk about Indigenous research methods and and uh, doing work with Native communities and, and Native American student support on campuses. And I always recommend, especially when you're looking at academic articles, we will find a way to identify our tribe. One way or another, <laughs> you will find, whether it's by our name or if it's hidden in there or if it's in a footnote, like we will put our tribe in there. So if you do not see that an author has snuck their tribe identification in there somewhere, they may not be Native. <laughs> Kristen, did you want to go ahead with your question? Um, sure. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, I'm in like a dark, creepy room. <laughs> so I turned off my camera. <laughs> Thank you so much. This has been really um helpful uh for me to to think about. Um and um I was just I guess that my question was almost 
for Alberto, but um, I was just thinking that we do have Native or in Indigenous students here um, and on campus, and I know many of us would love to hear more from them without, you know, directly asking, putting, putting them on the spot, of course. Um, and I was just wondering if the Center for Diversity, Equity, and Social Justice has had a chance yet to connect with some of those students and ask them what the best ways are to support them and, um, and if there's anything I can do to support that effort. Yeah, I mean, so our students hold different programs. Um, uh, one of those students is actually on this call, but um, Shandine is leading a program next week to talk about what being Navajo means to her. Um, so I, I would just encourage folks on this call, if you're available next Wednesday from five to six to attend that, but also um, always are invited to attend any of the Empower Hours. Each, um, we've got about 10 students who all have different identities that share their wisdom and their knowledge, their experiences. So yeah, that, that's probably one of the, the best places, I think, to, to connect with students, if that Excellent. helps. Thank you. Yeah, I'll look forward to um, to uh, that event next Thursday. And uh, yeah, thank you both. I think you you and maybe B mentioned it's a really good point. Don't just walk up to a native person and say, "Tell me all the things I need to know," <laughs> or "Tell me all your thoughts." Tell me the native perspective on this, that, or the other. Don't do that. <laughs> and it sounds like you all are already recognize that. And you got the hey, Jardine, nice to see you here. Um, I totally recommend always, if you have Native students on your campus and they're hosting events, go to their events. They really want you to go to their events. Uh, you know, I used to, at the University of South Dakota, we put on a powwow every year and people are always scared to come to the powwow. And they're like, I don't know what it is. I don't know what they want us to do. Does that mean I have to dance? Like, no, it's a social gathering. We need non-native people to show up so that we can get the funding we need to keep putting it on, you know, and we want to share our culture. And if we're hosting an event in which we're sharing about ourselves and our experiences and, and our culture, we want everyone to hear about it. So unless we say, you know, this is just for native folks, go, go to their events. It's such a great opportunity. I think we uh, should probably, I was thinking we might have time for one more, but it is 7.59 and I want to just respect your time, Dr. Bazemore, James, and everyone else's. So I just want to thank you so, so much for joining us. I It's always wonderful to hear you and see you. So I just really appreciate you sharing your time and your wisdom and expertise with us. Thank you to Nick for um, initiating this program and for all of you for attending so just want to um, wish you all a great night. Take care of yourselves. And uh, thanks again. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>